updated guidelines for a phased reopening uh, of the American economy. Uh, without uh, getting into any details, the booklet uh, is being sent out in real time to uh, states large and small across this country. We haven't had time to review the booklet and the guidelines in detail, uh, but I do want to extend just in broad strokes appreciation for what I heard uh, from the President as it relates to recognizing the differentiation that exists and persists in terms of conditions uh, in counties, not just in states uh, across this nation, and a willingness to recognize uh, and extend that uh, very directly to governors uh, of the need for a phased approach, a thoughtful and judicious approach based upon conditions uh, and based upon uh, the need uh, to act uh, with the kind of specificity at a state-by-state -state level that is required. So in broad strokes, I just want to acknowledge uh, the words, the President and the Vice President uh, in their presentation. It's ongoing. Forgive me uh, for having to step away, but I do want to provide our own announcements today. And we have a few people on the phone and didn't want to delay them uh, uh, away from their business uh, any longer as well. Uh, yesterday, we announced uh, specific strategies to address the needs for unemployed Californians and to do more and do better to quickly turn around unemployment insurance checks to set up a new PUA program, pandemic uh, uninsured, uh, a new system in this state for individual uh, contractors and small uh, individual uh, owners of businesses. Uh, we also uh, laid out strategies to help those that otherwise fell through the cracks in terms of the federal stimulus programs. Today, I want to talk about those essential workers that are not unemployed. Uh, that are every single day waking up uh, and putting on their uniforms of sorts uh, to take care of you and me. And that's the folks on the front lines of our food delivery system. Uh, I want to talk about work we're doing to support that sector and to support specifically the food chain in the state of California. When I speak of the food sector, when I think of terms of the food chain, I think about the people that grow our food, the people that pick our food, the people that pack our food, deliver our food, cook, serve, and sell our food. That's the food chain in the state of California, broadly defined. And that sector, by definition, is essential to our livelihoods and our capacity uh, to meet just basic needs through this pandemic. And that sector, in particular, has been hard hit uh, by strife, by challenges uh, in terms of health and safety, uh, by concerns uh, around what is happening within food processing plants, meat packing plants, not just, by the way, in the state of California, but you've seen headlines all across uh, America, particularly in South Dakota, related to the same. This is a serious issue, and it requires a serious response and a much more comprehensive uh, response uh, than we have currently offered. And so uh, today, just an hour or so ago, I signed a statewide executive order impacting the entire food chain and entire sector uh, that will allow for two weeks of supplemental uh, paid sick leave uh, for workers that have uh, been uh, well have contracted COVID-19, been exposed to it, or have been exposed to isolation or quarantine orders by local health officials, federal and or state health officials. I hope this will significantly address some of the anxiety our farm workers have, anxiety our fast food workers have, anxiety uh, around the delivery of our food and those workers have about their own health. We don't want you going to work if you're sick. And we want to make sure that you know that if you're sick, it's okay to acknowledge it and it's okay to let your employer know and still know that you're going to get a supplemental paycheck for a minimum of two weeks. And so I want to just thank uh, the grocer industry broadly. Uh, I want to thank UFCW, unions large and small, all across the state of California for working with us uh, and many uh, leaders across the spectrum, including a wonderful 
conversation I had yesterday with the Latino caucus that really brought up the importance uh, of focusing on those that pick and pack uh, our food uh, as essential workers and the dignity uh, of that work and the importance of protecting uh, them at, at this time of crisis and need. Uh, but there are two people in particular I want to thank individually, representing the California Grocers Association and representing uh, UFCW, uh, and that is uh, Ron Fong and John Grant. Uh, they're both on the phone, uh, and they have done something uh, very important, and that is they've worked across differences. They've worked together in a collaborative spirit uh, to address uh, some of the largest uh, the needs of some of the largest grocery store chains in America that happen to be here in the state of California, and one of the largest uh, grocer unions, uh, commercial and food workers unions in America as well. Uh, and they really started to focus on the needs for sanitation, for hand washing, for breaks to do the same, uh, to address the cleanliness of bathrooms for their workforce, and to make sure that you're protected, but those workers are protected. Uh, John Grant has been an extraordinary leader of his union, uh, and John reminded me, and I made this point a few weeks back, uh, that the grocery lines are also the front lines in this pandemic. Uh, the essential needs that all of us have of, of going to the grocery store and knowing those stores are stocked and, and knowing uh, what is essential is made available in real time. When this pandemic began to take shape, uh, all of us were struggling to respond to a little bit of binge buying, particularly toilet paper and certain types of breads and meats. Uh, that raised some supply chain concerns, some logistic warehousing concerns, uh, not just concerns from grocery workers themselves. We reached out to the California Grocers Association. We talked about what their needs were. We reached out to the union to talk about what their needs were. Uh, and they collectively uh, have worked out a framework uh, to agree uh, to a, a framework to support supplemental uh, paid sick uh, leave and also to address these sanitation issues. Uh, but no one better to describe uh, what they have advanced uh, and what they have done to help me guiding uh, the larger sector-wide executive order than the two people I'll introduce to you briefly. And I'll start uh, with the head of the California Grocers Association who's on the phone and uh, we'll make a, a comment or two and turn it over to John uh, representing the unions uh, and then talk a little bit more specifically uh, about their leadership after they have a chance to talk more uh, about what uh, advances they've made in terms of an accord. John, are we going to start with you? Sure. Great. John Grant. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Governor Newsom, for everything and for especially today recognizing the importance and the value of all the workers in the food chain and the incredible role that they're playing in keeping our communities fed. It's the public safety and the safety of all workers in our food chain, from the fields to the grocery store checkout stands, that's of critical importance. We have been proud and are proud to work collaboratively with your office and with Ron and the California Grocers Association to keep people fed and the community safe during this unprecedented crisis. Thank you again for listening to frontline workers and for granting paid sick leave to all of our food chain workers. I appreciate that, John, and thank you for your leadership. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, I would like to ask now Mr. Fong if he's on the line to say a few words as well. Thank you, Governor. First of all, we applaud your action, which provides some clarity and some added comfort, really, to our valued employees and customers that are a consistent set of best practices uh, being followed for all essential retail stores in California. You know, the top priority of every grocery store has always been the health and safety of our employees and our shoppers, which has taken on, obviously, an increased importance during this public health crisis. We really welcome the opportunity to collaborate with you, your administration, industry partners, and our organized labor friends to ensure consistent standards in all essential retail stores, including grocery, which will protect employees and shoppers and to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Thank you again, Governor, for your leadership in this opportunity. Now, again, uh, to both 
you, Ron and, and John, uh, we just really extend our heartfelt thanks uh, for all that you've done to, to keep those supply chains open, to continue to keep your minds open to the needs of one another. Um, you deal at a scale uh, unlike any other state because the size and scope of this state and your industry is just foundational to our capacity to deliver uh, the basic needs and necessities for 40 million Californians. So again, I cannot impress upon you more and others more our gratitude to both of you uh, for advancing that collective cause and helping again guide our larger sector-wide commitment uh, through this executive order. Again, impacting not just grocery stores, but the sector-wide executive order providing the two-week supplemental sick leave also extends to delivery services uh, to those larger fast food chains as well uh, as agricultural workers, uh, among others. And so thank you both. And, uh, and I'm very, again, grateful to our entire team, including Julie Sue, uh, who we introduced yesterday on unemployment insurance for all their work as well. There's an OSHA component to this uh, as it relates to health and safety uh, guidelines uh, that we collectively uh, as a group worked on together uh, to make sure uh, that those frontline workers are protected uh, and healthy. And let me just make one final point about our grocery workers and our pharmacists uh, as well and food workers. Um, you know, a lot of folks could easily dial it in, file for unemployment insurance, call it a day, uh, wait for this thing to pass. Uh, but there's dignity with work, and no one uh, that I know of in this essential workforce has done that. Uh, and with dignity comes respect and admiration uh, because you've not only dignified yourselves as frontline grocery workers, uh, but you've done it at a great cost. You put your personal health on the line every single day. Uh, I'll confess, um, myself included, sometimes we go to a grocery store, we're not always our best selves uh, because of the stress all of us are bringing uh, to bear in those lines, some large, some uh, short, uh, long and short. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to compliment you uh, for holding that line and continuing to uh, help us uh, reduce our own stresses. Uh, you're not spending much time with your kids and your families. Uh, and I just want you to know, I, I heard a few uh, grocery workers say this, uh, we're called essential workers, but increasingly we feel like we're disposable. And I want you to know you're not disposable. You are essential and you're valued. Uh, and I want, from the bottom of my heart, to extend my deep admiration and appreciation to you, those farm workers, and everybody else that every day are the unsung heroes that need to be called out at, at this moment for, yes, meeting this moment. Let me give you a brief update. We transition here to our daily briefing in terms of the total number of, uh, of lives that are lost, families torn asunder. Uh, yesterday, uh, I noted 63 deaths that it was among the highest number of death total uh, that we had recorded over a 24-hour period. Uh, today's numbers uh, are 69 individuals that passed away over the last 24 hours. 890 souls have been lost since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, it's a reminder, a very sober reminder, particularly in relationship to the announcement we made a few days ago uh, about the conditions we're looking for for a phased approach uh, to begin to pull back on our stay-at-home order and the announcement the president will be making uh, later this afternoon uh, in Washington, D.C., that we're not out of the woods, that we need to continue to be vigilant, we need to continue to practice physical distancing. We need to continue uh, to not just bend the curve, but flatten the curve and then see these trend lines uh, begin to decline substantially so that we can begin the process of toggling uh, back and forth in terms of looser uh, and, in some cases, more restrictive protocols uh, to get back to some sense of normalcy. In that regard, let me update you on the two numbers again, uh, in addition to the death rate, uh, that are the most important for us in terms of guiding uh, those decision making, or that decision making. And that's the total number of people on the ICUs and the total number of people that are hospitalized. 1,191 individuals are in our ICU uh, as of yesterday. It represents a 1.4% increase. Uh, day to day. You saw there was a modest decrease yesterday in ICUs. We're seeing a modest increase today in the number of people in our ICUs. 3,141 individuals, 3,141 
individuals uh, currently hospitalized. Uh, this is encouraging. We saw a modest decline in the total number of hospitalizations, 0.9 percent versus yesterday. Hospitalization numbers, as we've seen, have begun to flatten. The growth has begun to come down, but the growth has been coming down. Now we're seeing for one of the first days uh, since this pandemic uh, a modest decrease in hospitalizations. That's good news. But again, I caution everybody, one day's data point does not make a trend. A trend uh, needs not make a headline uh, until we have some certainty over the course uh, of a larger period and longer period uh, of time. Speaking uh, of a period of time, uh, I want to extend great appreciation for those of you that have joined our core of volunteers over the period of the last number of weeks. Uh, it is remarkable the number of people that have gone to the serve.ca.gov website, serve.ca.gov website uh, to sign up Cal volunteers and others to help support our food banks, which are also essential uh, from farm to food bank, uh, essential uh, at this time of need. Uh, we continue to encourage and hope for more volunteers and just want to encourage you and hope that if you are interested, you go to that website, serve.ca.gov, and learn more about how you can contribute, not just in terms of volunteering at a food bank, uh, but also ways of giving blood and also ways of giving your time, energy, and attention to those uh, most in need and most vulnerable at this moment of crisis. So that's it in broad strokes uh, where we are uh, today. Uh, I'm very grateful for uh, the incredible work and partnership uh, within the food sector uh, and very honored to make the announcement we did today uh, on a paid supplemental sick leave. Uh, again, this is something uh, for those, just final point on this, uh, for those that were not part of the federal uh, supports. These are for the larger sector employers, uh, so we are dealing with the gap in that system. It's a pro quite profound gap, uh, but we believe we have closed that significantly uh, with this executive order today. Happy now to take any questions. Katie Orr, KQED. Um, Governor, you have said that your goal uh, by the end of the month is to have 25,000 tests done a day. And in your roadmap, you say that we need the ability to monitor and protect communities through testing. Is that the same number? Is that Are you looking for 25,000 tests a day uh, to fulfill that requirement, or is there a different number you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, no, that came from our task force report. By the way, 18,800 tests were conducted in the last 24 hours. We've been able to substantially address the backlog uh, in terms of the test results. So we're indeed making progress pursuant uh, to that task force and their specific recommendations and the metrics uh, that were inherent in uh, that uh, announcement. And so you're correct. The uh, goal, the expectation that I have is uh, north of 25,000, 25,000 being a baseline. But to answer your question more specifically, no, we'll need to broaden still our testing capacity, broaden still our ability to do community surveillance uh, in uh, this state. Interestingly, again, I am cautious. I don't like talking out of school about uh, a private conversation the president was just having perhaps is still having with governors across this country. Uh, but he led with a focus and an appreciation the need to do more testing uh, and maintained uh, that the federal government will be doing uh, much more still in that space, which will only further uh, help our efforts. Uh, we are certainly uh, not attaching ourselves to the federal efforts, but we're encouraged to hear uh, more in that space. Uh, but this clearly is, to your point, it's one of our six frameworks uh, for reintroducing uh, new statewide recommendations and guidelines is a predicate. Testing, the ability to trace, again, isolate and quarantine. Uh, we today uh, talked uh, our first order of business, our early morning meeting, uh, about all of these new divisions of labor uh, related to those six uh, work groups that we have convened. Uh, and as I committed to you yesterday, I'll reinforce it again today on a weekly basis. I'll be updating you on every task force and where they are pursuant to those guidelines we put out earlier in the week. So everybody is up to speed in real time in terms of where we are across the panoply of guidelines that we put out, not just testing. Carl Rico, Univision Fresno. 
Governor, thank you. I thank you and all those that are thinking about the undocumented in California. And we want to ask you how soon will we know the names of those organizations that will be getting the money? And how soon can people, the people that need the help, will start you know, to be able to get the money? Also, you said yesterday that there will be no need of personal information. Right. And we were wondering, so there's no need of personal information. How can you keep track of who is getting the money or how many people will be getting the money? And um, how can you you, uh, who's going to oversee the money that's going to get from the state to the organizations and from the organizations out to those who really need it. And finally, I wanted to confirm with you, this money, either the $500 or 1000 that people will be getting, they will not have to pay it back. No, it is direct disaster relief, direct disaster assistance will not have to be paid back. $500 per individual, up to $1,000 uh, per household. Uh, and you are correct. We're working with community-based organizations, uh, and we have oversight through the Department of Social Services led by Kim Johnson. That's the answer to the question of who. Uh, that's the individual, her team. That's the agency. And their departments will be responsible and accountable for organizing the distribution of these funds and responsible and accountable for making sure that none of the personal information is brought in to the state government uh, so we can protect people's privacy. However, at the distribution front, uh, we have the CBOs that will be processing individuals and will be responsible for tracking uh, those distributions and uh, those dollars. Again, we begin by providing a minimum of $5 million for CBOs whose names will appear on our covid19.ca.gov website. covid19.ca.gov website very shortly. I was told as early as this afternoon but I was told that a few hours ago and did not get a follow-up uh, to my question uh, exactly what we're putting out. But they are to told me that they're putting out the guidelines uh, and providing a Q&A of frequently asked questions so we can anticipate uh, not only the questions you just asked, but anticipate the questions uh, hundreds of thousands of Californians uh, will be asking about this program. And so expect to see uh, that up in a culturally competent way. It will be translated into seven different languages and has already been translated in Spanish. Amanda Carroll, KSBK. Hi, Governor. Thank you for taking my question. I'm curious about the homeless. You said that they are a priority in protecting our homeless, yet I've discovered there's such a delay in getting them to the trailers at Cal Expo. As of Monday, they were still empty, and there's reports of San Francisco shelters being empty. Were you aware of this? What do you think about how long this is taking to protect our homeless, and what could we do better? Yeah, I, it, look, at the end of the day, we are providing resources, and I mean resources at historic levels, $800 million to cities and counties and what we refer to as COCs. Uh, and we are providing not just trailers, but thousands and thousands and thousands of hotel rooms of which the state working with FEMA through Project Room Key specifically is targeting reimbursements uh, that will allow us uh, to provide uh, for an unprecedented number of isolated spaces uh, for our most vulnerable Californians. Uh, let me be very specific with you. On Saturday, I will be making a very specific announcement of where we are with Project Room Key, what the total occupancy is uh, by region in the state, not only for hotel rooms, uh, but also for the trailers themselves. Uh, and I deeply recognize, the answer to your question, I deeply recognize the disparities within cities and counties about how quickly some people are utilizing the resources the state has been made, making available, and how others are still struggling to do that, and how we can help support uh, those uh, that aren't able to quickly uh, amass their resources to match our resources. So expect that coming up on Saturday. Rachel Bluth, Kaiser Health News. Hi, Governor. You said that you wanted to broaden the state's test capacity. I was hoping that you could kind of walk us through specifically where you think California's testing shortfalls are and, you know, where you think California needs to do better. Yeah, I think primarily this has been a mantra of ours, and we've said it on, I think, yesterday, day before, last week, 
week prior. The most important uh, thing we can attach to the testing uh, is equity. That's the lens through which we see the world. It is foundational, and that's where we must do better. We need to be much bolder in that space uh, to provide communities that so often are left out uh, of the opportunity, allow them to avail themselves of the opportunity of not only being tested, uh, but treated as well. And so this remains a, a major issue. Those with means, those with resources, those with contacts and relationships, uh, traditionally across the spectrum, not just on testing, but across the spectrum, uh, find opportunities of support often uh, ahead of the line uh, of others. And so it's incumbent upon government to be there protecting the most vulnerable. And so that remains the top priority of our task force uh, and top priority of Dr. Galley, who's leading those task force efforts. Doug Sobern, KCBS. Hi, Governor. Uh, I'm wondering, um, we are told that the president told you today that uh, the governors can call their own shots and that while he wants everyone open May 1st, if you can open sooner, great. If you need to open later, that's fine. It's up to you. Given that, um, what practical impact, if any, uh, is his guidance and whatever he's going to say later today publicly going to have on when and how California reopens and how you proceed. Does it really matter? It sounds like he is leaving it essentially up to you. And one other question. Um, as you know, Bernie Sanders, President Obama, Elizabeth Warren, Adam Schiff, many people have endorsed Joe Biden this week. Uh, more than a month ago, your preferred candidate Kamala Harris did. Are you intending to endorse Joe Biden yeah. sometime soon? And if so, when? You've just reminded me of politics. Uh, candidly, uh, I've been so focused on COVID-19. Uh, haven't been asked. I appreciate that question, and, uh, and I certainly look forward to it. But in the relationship to the uh, more pressing question in terms of the immediate needs of 40 million Californians, uh, you are correct. Uh, glad you said it. I didn't say it, having uh, participated in that phone call for the first 40 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, had to engage with you, not unfortunately, but my responsibility was engaged with you, so I had to pull away uh, from the conference call. I heard the same words from the president, and that was, as I said, encouraging. So I don't know what will be said tonight, and I also caution, uh, as I said just in the outset of this, uh, this briefing, that we haven't yet received the booklet. And so when we do, uh, we'll have a better sense uh, of how it aligns uh, with the protocols, procedures, the processes that we laid out a number of days ago. Uh, but based upon uh, the early input, or at least early discussion we had on that phone call, uh, it certainly was in line uh, with what we were hoping to hear. Taryn Luna, LA Times. Governor, you've acknowledged the economic toll of the, shut, uh, the stay home order from mass unemployment, you know, a recession that's going to take a long time to dig out of, other unrelated health issues, students losing access to education. And at the same time, you've also talked a lot about the goal of the order, you know, to prevent hospitals from being overrun with sick patients and prevent Californians from potentially dying. Can you explain how you weighed the risks posed by the virus versus the consequences of the shutdown? Well, we make those adjustments. We do that analysis every single morning, every single day. We're constantly iterating, uh, constantly uh, toggling, as I said, back and forth in terms of our approach uh, on this. Look, the reason we put out the guidelines, the uh, reason we socialized those a number of days ago, the reason uh, we uh, brought you into that conversation and unveiled the six core areas uh, was to example more prescriptively how we will go about making decisions as we balance uh, those issues. And you're right, uh, those are the issues we're all struggling with and all trying to balance. That said, let me uh, just uh, give you an update on the conversation we had this first thing this morning. I gave you the death numbers. I, I gave you uh, a sense of our um, anxiety still around the hospitalization uh, numbers, uh, with the exception of today, not having yet gone down, just the rate of growth beginning to slow down. But we're still seeing hot spots throughout the state of California. Uh, in Tulare, uh, another skilled nursing facility, we get updated on a daily basis on what's happening in real time all across the state. And so I remind everybody, we talk so often as states, as a nation, in the aggregate. Talk about numbers in the aggregate. Those ICU numbers are the aggregate. The hospitalization numbers, aggregate. But none of us live in the aggregate. Our experience is completely unique. We live with our own set of eyes 
on the basis of what's happening in our diverse communities, county by county, census track by census track, neighborhood by neighborhood. And while some of our hospitals uh, have a substantial capacity, others, I got a few calls from hospitals yesterday that were using up to 80% of their ventilators, despite the fact we have over 9,357 ventilators that are not being used in our entire hospital system. It just gives you a sense of how we have to manage through this uh, with nuance and precision and specificity uh, and not lose sight uh, of our status as the nation's largest state, many parts, one body. Jeremy White, Politico. Hey, Governor. Um, my question about your conversation um, with the president has kind of already been covered. So I wanted to talk to you, talk to you about um, Elon Musk asking you to correct the record about whether or not those ventilators he promised were supplied to hospitals. Your administration had said that it's not gotten information they were received. Elon Musk claims that they were. Can you clarify what's going on here? Yeah, no. Uh, first of all, I appreciate Elon. I appreciate others that have really stepped up and uh, lent their support and offered even more support beyond uh, what has been made public. Uh, that list uh, he put out again today, apparently there was a list that came in uh, yesterday of a number of the hospitals. I was not personally aware of that list. I'm very encouraged uh, that he put out that list and those specific hospitals. That's where uh, he had been sending uh, those resources and I uh, look forward to learning more about where they went and I'm grateful for his support. Sharon Bernstein, Reuters. Thank you for taking my question. Um, New York recently um, revised the number of deaths upward quite dramatically because they started adding cases where people had not been tested for COVID, but they, their doctors felt that they had probably passed away from it. I was wondering if there was any um, consideration in California of doing something similar to that, and if so, when that might happen and what you anticipated, um, how you anticipated that might affect the numbers here. No, I, I'm very thoughtful question. And uh, let me offer you a very thoughtful response uh, through the expertise and lens of Dr. Galley. Thanks again for the question. Uh, we absolutely are looking closely at that number of deaths in California. And as we reported out every single day, we're aware that there's a number of other people in California that are dying in our hospitals and our healthcare delivery system and understanding how that will contribute to our overall COVID uh, death toll number in the state of California is important. Uh, we are still working hard with our hospitals, our morgues, our coroners, to um, uh, manage that uh, issue for us. And unlike New York, uh, we, we uh, haven't been uh, adjusting that number up, but we're very aware that is something in the next weeks to come that we will be working on to make sure that A, we communicate clearly to the public uh, what that death toll number is in California as it relates to COVID-19, but it's also very important as we plan in the future, and we look not just at hospitalizations and ICU numbers, but that total death number to understand how it's impacting our communities and our readiness to modify the stay-at-home order and other initiatives that the state has taken. Thank you, doctor. Next question. Final question, Jim Roop, Westwood One News. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I was hoping to get some clarification on this new thing you announced today, the supplemental, uh, I guess, the extra two-week sick leave for uh, to fill in the gap for the people who don't qualify for the stimulus or whatever that is. And I think you referenced the meatpacking plant in South Dakota. Well, the main issue there that was, uh, at least the union there believes that it was a little bit late in yeah, the the owners of the meatpacking plant a little bit late in in, uh, in imposing some health measures there or some safety measures there, and then subsequently when these uh, employees became ill and had to take off work, they wanted to rush to get back to work because they had to help support their families and so on and so forth. So I'm guessing that's the idea here. If that is the case. Those who are, I guess, don't fall in that gap, 
uh, they too would just have two weeks sick leave, and they would want to get back to work uh, to start making money if their sick leave runs out. So how 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 do we how do we clarify or justify or do I have this wrong? I guess I'm just trying to get some clarification on the the whole idea of this particular program. No, I not, think, that, not that I don't like it. No. I just want to get some clarification. No, I, I appreciate it, and, and I think you've got the spirit of what uh, we are advancing. The brothers and sisters at UFCW uh, obviously impacted greatly by what happens in other states with their members, uh, and that was just an expression of anxiety. By the way, uh, it would be unfair of me just to point out to that example in another state. Uh, we have an example in San Joaquin Valley right now at a very large uh, food distribution center uh, where we have 51 positives. One individual has passed away in a facility that has over 1,700 workers. It just reinforces the anxiety people have that may not have basic care, basic sick leave. And so what this is, is supplemental. It does not negate any existing benefits uh, that are afforded, nor does it negate the work that's done in a number of cities that have also put an overlay of support uh, with their sick leave. Uh, and nor is it uh, exclusive. Uh, we have child care provisions uh, where we made available $100 million of child care funds and included grocery workers uh, as a prioritization to access those child care facilities. Uh, I announced on April 2nd $17.8 million uh, for workforce development grants to match our workforce. Uh, that is specifically targeted to backfill any loss of, of labor uh, in the grocery industry, among other industries that we deem essential so that we can quickly mobilize individuals as they pull off the line because of their health concerns. We can bring people on the line uh, that are otherwise healthier. We just want folks to know they don't have to work when they're sick if they've been exposed quarantine, been told to isolate, uh, or have uh, a positive test of COVID-19. And I think all of us would agree uh, that people delivering the food, uh, people picking the food, uh, people that are cooking the food and serving the food, uh, all of us would prefer they're safe and healthy as well. So it's in all of our interests uh, that we prioritize the interests of these critical and essential workers. Uh, let me thank everybody, uh, as always, for time and attention. Forgive us for being um, past the time that we normally uh, allot for this because of the call with the president. Uh, look forward tomorrow to talking more about economic development, and as I said on Saturday, uh, more broadly, or rather more specifically, uh, about some of the work we're doing uh, on homelessness throughout the state of California as well. I'll just remind everybody, uh, stay-at-home order is currently still in effect. Uh, you have successfully bent and arguably flattened the curve in the state of California. Uh, we continue to need to maintain our vigilance, guided not by political decision-making, guided by data, guided by facts, guided by science, guided by health professionals all throughout the state of California in consultation and partnership with health officials all across the nation. We still have a stay-at-home order, and it is incumbent upon all of us to continue to practice appropriate physical distancing so that we can get back to a sense of normalcy sooner than we would otherwise uh, if we pull back too soon. Keep up the great work and stay healthy.